Hey y'all, what's up? This is Aaron LeBauer with the Cash PG Lunch Hour podcast. And today I'm bringing John Schumacher on, another one of my mentors and business coaches who really got the ball rolling for me. If you've ever been on one of my webinars, it's because of this guy right here. So oh. John, thank you for being on, being on the show and taking time to come speak with us today. Yeah, you bet, Aaron. You know, it's, uh, I can't take credit for everything you've done by any stretch, man. But yeah, I remember years ago when we first started like, trying to launch your cash PT blueprint and those programs. And we're like, you know, like, is this going to work or whatever? And it, I remember you getting messages from you like, all right, we sold one, we sold another one. And that was just how many years ago, but it's, it's been fun to see you just really explode the last Thank like you. several years. Yeah. I remember, I, I don't know if you remember this, but you, you were on the phone and I was talking on the phone. I was sitting in my garage and I was sitting here going, I've got to create a course, but this company just told me they wanted $10,000 and they were going to, give me a course to teach me how to create a course. And I was like, this doesn't seem real. And I sat there on the phone and you were like, Aaron, you can do this, you know, and uh, you've got a six figure business in your head. You just need to unpack it. And let me show you these one or two things. And it was relatable and real. And I felt like I trust you because you're a physical therapist as well. So right. I, don't, I just want to say thank you very much because it was that moment where I was like, oh, and then you showed me how to basically sell my product before I before I built it. Yeah, we pre-sold it and then um, had, a, had a, a fairly successful little seed launch to your audience. And then you just, you've just kind of kept going and going and going. And then you're doing webinars and yeah. you just kept going and going and going. And that's, that's all you, man. That's <laughs> been crushing it. So we could, yeah. I, could learn, I could learn from you too. I'm sure you've learned a lot of stuff. So what, what's this Star Wars line? It's now the teacher. Is yes. The, or the student is the master. The student is the master. Yes. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. I feel like it's quite that way with, uh, with us and with Wade. But as we've, in the last few years, you're doing a whole lot of a few different things. I'm doing a whole lot yep. of a few different things. And it's like, the, the thing I value the most is was, even with some of the posts you put on Facebook and the things you put on your blog lately is they're so full of value and I can go and look at that and John just taught me one thing and he doesn't even know it. <laughs> you you know? ripped me off, huh? <laughs> right? Yeah, that's fine. But, man, that goes back to how you got started. So you're, so with your physical therapy, being a physical therapist and some of the videos that you put out, I think there was like a, you did like some sacral reset or a hip yep. pain, sacrum pain video that had a ton of views. So can you catch us up like, Tell us about like, how'd you get into physical therapy? And then, yeah. we're, you know, like, how'd, how'd you get into physical therapy? It'd be an interesting journey for people listening who are physical therapists or other healthcare professionals. Cause that, yeah, that was my background as a physical therapist. Uh, I got into it. I was an athlete as a kid. I loved the human body. I was obsessed with it. I studied it all the time. Even when I wasn't in school, I always tend to kind of go all in on things when I do them. And at that time it was, you know, studying the human body, becoming an excellent therapist. And I graduated from school. I jumped into a busy outpatient clinic and, uh, you know, was taking weekend classes and courses, just learning all kinds of like manual techniques and muscle energy, and, you know, assessment of movement and all this kind of stuff that I just loved to geek out on at the time. And, and was really just all in for like a few years there in a busy clinic. I was working for someone else. I didn't work. I opened my own clinic like you did out, out the gate. So uh, and then I started like kind of getting a little burnout after about three years of working for somebody else. And I found a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I don't know if you're probably mm -hmm. familiar with that. Read it, read it, it completely just scrambled up my whole brain around like, what am I doing? You know, I'm working for somebody else and kind of like, I'm, only gonna, I'm always going to be on this treadmill type thing. So I started looking at other ways of making money. And I, you know, I dabbled with a lot of, of crazy things I look back on. Now, um, I looked, I did look at like, you know, what would it take to open a practice and had some colleagues in, in, in Santa Cruz where I was living that were doing that kind of thing, like opening a practice. But I just kind of felt like, oh, it's a lot of risk. And I was kind of scared to do that a lot of overhead and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and just wanted to take a, a more, I guess, laid back approach to doing that. So I looked at this thing called the, you know, the internet right at the time and was like, well, I wonder if I could make some money off of this. So didn't really know what I was doing and started creating videos and stuff like sharing my knowledge on, on a site that was no, not new, but fairly new at the time called YouTube. Right. And that's, right. I say everybody knows what that is now. And that's how you and I met was you were creating, you know, YouTube videos mm -hmm. for how to make your body feel better and those kind of things. And, and so was I. And so there was maybe this small group of us at the time that were creating these, these videos and mine were these hideous little flip phone videos that I used to take my girlfriend at the time and now my now wife would like right. 
film me doing these like things. And some of them got like hundreds of thousands of views and stuff like, uh, you know, from, I learned a little bit of SEO and how to get those videos up, just basic keyword stuff. And, mm -hmm. and, it, and it worked. And, you know, so I got a bunch of traffic and, and uh, sold a few like eBooks and stuff when that was new, but never really like knew what I was doing at the time a, a whole lot. Um, I had a, a live stream video show for a while interviewing healthcare entrepreneurs and all that kind of stuff. And, and then, um, you know, I just decided that I really loved the marketing more than anything else. As much as I love parts of physical therapy and the human body, I, I just was in, fell in love and I was spending my time learning and reading about marketing all the time and like online marketing and stuff like that. So, you know, I just made that pivot and haven't, haven't looked back since I've been, you know, doing this now full time for, for six years and, and part time another few years before that even and, yeah. and stuff like that. So it's just been a kind of a crazy journey. That's awesome, man. So right now, um, who, like, who do you, who are you helping right now and what are you helping them do? Yeah. So I have a, a little bit of a hodgepodge of clientele, but the main persons I'm working with are, um, coaches, consultants, and companies, um, I still, I help them mainly with client acquisition. So mm -hmm. sometimes that's a webinar. That's kind of what I'm known for. Like if you Google me or, you know, put webinar coach into Google or something, I come up with the number one in like Google searches for a lot of terms and stuff like that. So I get a lot of leads from Google, Facebook, referrals, stuff like mm -hmm. that. So, so yeah, I, I just, you know, you know, kind of continue to hone my skills as, as a strategist, a, a marketing strategist, a client acquisition strategist. So I, I help companies and individuals. Most of those individuals are like coaches and consultants who want more clients. I help them put together plans to, and help them implement plans to acquire more clients for themselves. That's awesome. And, you know, by the way, because you're listening to this podcast, this podcast started as a live web show, the way John taught me how to do it. And then like, I think the first 20 or 30 episodes were done that way and repurposed onto iTunes when I had the bandwidth to be able to do that. So John, like, this is like, this is perfect because, you know, like, like really you helped me get this show off the ground and a lot of, and, and a lot of these other things because you said, Hey Aaron, there's this new thing called webinar jam and you need to try it out. And I was like, yeah. Oh my God. But so let's go back. Right. YouTube was kind of new. Webinar Jam was definitely new at that point. I think this month I have to like upgrade to 4.0 or my right. webinars yeah, go away. Coming out. You know, like how, like what was it happening at the time or what is it about you that got you looking in other areas for um, like, like the answers or solutions? Like, what is that? Yeah. Like, why did I want to make money online or something? Yeah. Like why, why did you yeah. see YouTube as this possibility? And why did you see webinars? Like, what is it? Like, was this, was these just was that just luck or was yeah, this probably. something you saw like people were saying like you know like we should do you know like yeah you, remember? you know part of it's luck part of it was just like I, I experiment a lot like I always experiment and I still do today I spend a significant portion of my time experimenting and, and sometimes that gets me into trouble like because I get unfocused but other times it really helps me make incredible breakthroughs too like I mean I got my largest contract ever by far this past year and if I wouldn't wasn't experimenting I would have never got it right. So there's there's something to be said about niching, and there's also something to be to be said about continuing to expand at the same time. So it, it really was about that, like uh, you know, experimenting with stuff. So you know, I I, I got the idea because I thought I thought it would be cool to have like a channel that you know shared my expertise and stuff uh, mm -hmm. for physical therapy. So initially it was like this would be a cool tool to have or a cool this or that to have. And then I just kind of extended into, into live video, which was brand new at the time for consumers. I mean, there was a few larger companies doing that, but it was more or less just me trying stuff and then kind of liking it or seeing it as an opportunity. I really, really wanted to figure out how to like leave my job. Right. You no. Know, so I was like experimenting with maybe this will work or that'll work and stuff like that. So it was kind of selfish in the sense that I just, I wanted my freedom. I wanted to be able to uh, replace my income and those kind of things. And I was trying different things and, you know, at the time it was revolutionary to be able to like live stream from your computer. This was before Facebook live or, you know, any of this stuff. And this so. is only like five years ago. <laughs> maybe, maybe five or six. It was a little, a little longer than that. ago. 2013, I, I think. Oh yeah. Maybe, it, that's, yeah, maybe seven years ago, eight, yeah. seven or eight years ago, but yeah. Uh, yeah. And you know, so a lot's changed since then. So I actually became the guru in that, like it was one of my first programs I was sold. Mm -hmm. It was a Google Hangouts 
training program and oh, all that yeah. stuff. And yeah. I did a, did a bunch of JV webinars and stuff like that with it. And it sold really well, like, uh, cause it was so revolutionary. It was mm-hmm. just a, such a brand new thing. Like, Oh my gosh, you can live stream from your computer, you know, like this is, this is like unheard of, you know, back then. So, right. So that's gonna, right. that's I, really I just kind of awesome. got into it and experimented. Yeah. So what was it about your job you didn't like and why, and, and conversely, what is it about what you're doing now that, that fills your bucket? You know, I think the biggest thing for me was freedom. Like I don't want to, I never wanted to work for somebody, you know, I mean, I didn't enjoy that aspect of it. So I was, you know, plotting my way out of that, so to speak. But, you know, so, so that, I, there was parts of therapy I loved. Like I love the science of it. I love the, uh, the analysis, the movement analysis and, and extra, you know, prescription of certain you know, activities and things like that. I love, I love that part of it. I just didn't like working for somebody else. I didn't want to have an income cap, you know, that kind of thing, which came with working for someone on like an hourly or annual basis. And I, and I didn't really want to, you know, open my own practice. I just, at the time I was, my thinking was that it just felt like a lot of overhead and a lot of mm-hmm. potential stress and risk. And I just wanted something that would allow me to have complete control over my own schedule and time and those kind of things. And, and that's what I have now, you know, like the last several years I've been full time, make a nice income. I can fire, hire, hire, fire clients. You know, I can set my own hours. Like I always quit at two o'clock. Like I'm a little, little overtime today, you know, and, and I got, you know, get my son, you know, all those kind of things, you know, just you know, go work out. So I'll go, I'll go from this to go work out, to go pick up my son, to come back. And I can just kind of write my own schedule, you know, yeah. and there's certain, it certainly sounds great and it is, and it's what I want, like the, the freedom and, and the flexibility. That's really what I wanted. Um, but there's also stresses with it too, of course, like the stresses of, you know, running a, a, a business and figuring all these things out. Now it's getting better. It's gotten better as I'm sure it has for you too, to like, you know, manage all the stuff. But, yeah. um, have you gotten to that point where, um, uh, where it's like that you have so much freedom that it's almost like, Oh, I don't know how to make a choice. Or if I do make, it's almost like this paradox, like freedom, paradox of freedom. I have so much freedom in my business that it's, like, oh, I couldn't possibly do that because like, why would I move across country? Like for me, it's like, why would I move across country? Because my dad would get upset, you know, but I have the freedom to do it. And he's not here six months out of the year anyways. You know what I mean? Like at some point there's like this almost like I've got too much freedom. Do you, do you experience that or? Um, I don't know if I, if I, if I feel that as much, like for me, I'm very focused. Like I, uh-huh. I don't, I, I if people, people are like, well, how do you stay motivated working from home? Right. Or, you know, how do you stay motivated? And for me, it's not hard at all. Like I, I, this is what I love. This is what I do. This is what I want to get better and better at. And I'm just getting started, mm-hmm. you know, right now. So like, I'm just getting started, like really growing. That's awesome. And um, so is it John that you like, you know, okay, I know what I'm doing every day, you know, all day tomorrow or every hour tomorrow. Are you pretty regimented with your schedule and you know what you're doing or? I'm personally not like hour by hour, minute by minute. Some day, there's some days like that, but no, like I have a few um, big things I want to do each day and I just focus on those. So I do have a calendar, obviously I block out time there. There's time specific events that I need to do like this interview. I have to be here at two and show up and, and do those things. Or I had a client um, meeting this morning at, 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 um, at 10 o'clock. So I, I had to be there for those kind of things. And then I, then I took off, went to a coffee shop and did a little bit of work on my computer. Uh, I'm actually creating a new uh, VSL for one of my offers. So I, you know, so I have a few things I like to get done each day, but I don't like, I have a, I have a routine for sure, but I'm not like to the minute, you know, yeah. about things. So you're not like super regimented, but you kind of have an idea like, here's I'm what organized. I need to get done. Yeah. I'm organized every day. I write out my day every day. You know, I know the big things I need to focus on and get to, and I just focus on those and execute those. So, I mean, I have my whole week written out before the week starts and stuff. So I'm fairly organized. I don't let things slip very often. Mm -hmm. I just don't like do every minute, you know, in my calendar. And you show up when you say you're going to show up. Oh, almost all. I try to never, ever miss something. Like if I say I'm going to do something, I try to do it. Yeah. That's awesome. What, uh, what's the number one thing that you like what's the number one thing that you do each day to make sure that your business moves forward? Is there like, is there like an activity or, uh, you know, something as part of your routine or non-routine that you're doing? Like, you know, okay, I'm, you know, you know yeah. what I'm asking? Yeah. Yeah. So 
so for me, it's, it's creating and connecting. So for me, I, I create a lot of content, uh, materials. I'm always you know, publishing stuff prolifically and I am connecting always. So like, if, you know, if you have a pipeline of, of prospects, I'm connecting with them on a consistent basis every day. It's like, okay, who can I speak to that, that can move my business forward? Who might become a client? you know, and, and all those things. So one, so basically it's, if you're a coach or consultant, the three, three C's is like, you know, you should be creating, you should be connecting and you should be coaching, right? Like, mm-hmm. so you should be better at all of those things. And so those are what I, what I do most of the time, is, you know, I'm either you know, on a client call or doing an interview or something, which this could be under creating, we're creating some materials here. Um, and then, and then connecting in between. So right. I, those are the things that I focus on, like, you know, how can I serve my clients better so they love me and they refer people to me? How can I generate more conversations with qualified leads to, to, to grow and to keep the pipeline full? Mm-hmm. How did you figure that out? I mean, like, what are you doing to get better and, and grow and figure these things out? Well, I mean, I've hired some, I've paid a lot of money to people like you have, you know, like we've, we've, we've learned from people much smarter than ourselves. Mm-hmm. And I always try to have mentors or people like that in my corner. I was in a, $25,000 mastermind last year. So I paid 25 grand to be a part of this group. You know, I was, um, you know, I've hired, you know, multiple mentors for 10, five, $10,000 things at times and stuff like that. Uh, so part of it is, is, is learning from smarter people. Like I, it's a mistake for us to think that we have all the answers or that we're so intelligent, even though you might be, you know, Tiger Woods is the best golfer in the world in his prime, but he still had multiple people giving him input and stuff like that to improve his swing and performance. You know, it's no difference for us as business owners, like and entrepreneurs and, and people that really want to be in the top part of your organization. You have to commit to being excellent and learning from smart people. And then the other part is just me reading. I read, I, I learn, I implement a lot of stuff. I experiment a lot, you know, mm. so I experiment with a lot of stuff. And and then I take kind of what works, which is most things don't work, right? Like most campaigns don't do as well as you like. And I don't care how good you are, you're still going to have campaigns that don't do as well. Um, but then you take the things that do work and, and you just, you double down on that. Yeah. So like if, if a campaign or an idea, something doesn't work for you, like what do you, what do, you do about that? How do you, no. how do you handle it? Well, it depends. Like, you know, and sometimes you'll just scrap it and, and, you, and you'll go on to another thing. You have to kind of decide, was it, is it, you know, the idea that sucked or was it, was it, you know, the way it was executed or just, you know, those kind of things. So, you know, I think it's just a matter of, you know, being self-aware enough to, to go after something if it really matters to you or, and figure it out, you know? So I, I don't think you should ever quit on your macro goals, like your big picture, like for you, it might've been growing this online business. Mm-hmm. You might've had to quit certain parts of it, you know, that certain ideas that didn't work or a campaign that needed to be adjusted or whatever, but ultimately, you know, you don't, you're not going to quit on your, your bigger goal, you know? Right. right. That's awesome. I just want to like, you know, point that, you know, like point that out because sometimes people like you and me don't see those things as like the end game. But for a lot of people who aren't used to entrepreneurship, they, they get a little resistance from these things because people around them are telling them you shouldn't do this. It's a bad idea. And then they let these things be the excuse to, as to why they've stopped. Right. Do you see that in people? Well, of course. Yeah. I mean, most people, they take one punch in the stomach and they quit. Right. And that's yeah. like, if you're going to do this kind of thing, like you're going to have to take a lot of no's, a lot of failure, quote unquote failures, or just things that don't work out. I have a saying that I tell my clients is, is you know, most things in life don't work out. Right. Mm-hmm. Most dates don't end in marriage. Most, you know, business ideas don't take off immediately. Right. I mean, it's very rare that anyone has a, such an original idea that it just takes off on its own. Right. It takes a lot of grit and determination and focus and, and those kind of things. And, and so you just got to get used to it. You know, like for me, I have, even the disappointments are, they happen all the time, you know, but it's like, you just keep moving so fast that you don't have time to worry about that stuff. You just keep the going, keep the pipeline going, keep your focus moving forward and fall in love with the process, you know, uh, I can't remember if it was Dwayne Dyer, I think he said that, you know, if you want to, if you want to be more relaxed and happy in life, you know, release the need to worry about other people's opinions of you and release the need to have your outcome happen for you every time, right? Mm-hmm. Like just fall in love with the process. Don't worry too much about what other people think of you and, and just keep going. And eventually you will gain momentum. Wow. That's awesome. That's powerful. Um, 
I want to kind of, I want to shift a little bit, but I want to go back to something you said. You said, sure. Aaron, I'm thinking about creating a new, like what you're working on, a VSL. So for everyone that's listening, you know, just briefly tell them what is a VSL. Yeah, it's a video sales letter. So it's basically a, a sales letter, a sales message that's recorded uh, in mm -hmm. video format. So it's usually a slide deck presentation, usually, you know, eight minutes to 25 minutes in length. And it, it's designed to just give a very concise marketing message to a specific type of person. That's awesome. And so yeah. here's, here's what I want to, I want to lead this in with Facebook ads aren't the way they used to be. Right. And it's harder sure. and harder for us to market, like, especially a physical therapy clinic, but anything marketing on Facebook, it's not the same. And we still have to kind of try. One of the things that was working for me for a long time was like writing an ebook, which is just a you know PDF of, basically the same information that's in a VSL. Yep. So my question really is, do you think like, because you said, Hey, I'm doing a VSL. Like I've done a couple myself, but do you think a VSL is more what people are looking for now? Like as some kind of video format versus a downloadable read at home on your device type of information, or are they still about the same? You know, what do you think? Well, I mean, it just depends on your goal a little bit too. Um, you know, and who you're marketing to, mm -hmm. right? So Smaller like things like a PDF download can still be great for driving leads to your email list and stuff like that. Um, a VSL is is a little more of a commitment to them, you know. So, but but it can also it might cost you a little more to get a lead, but it's usually maybe a little higher quality lead in some cases if they're willing to go through uh, the VSL. So. Um, there is a shift in, in, in front end. What I, mean, what I mean by front end is the way that you acquire new leads into your funnel for most businesses. Right. Um, and it's, it's a trend towards, you know, shorter kind of duration stuff, especially for business to business marketing. So like if it's a really compelling PDF, that could be one good strategy. And then on the thank you page, you have your, your VSL basically, right. Uh -huh. Where you, where you can induce them to book a call and follow up with them and those kind of things. Um, and same thing with with the business to business for like a shorter video presentation like a VSL. You know, someone if it's a good a good hook and headline, they may watch an eight to to twenty minute video. They're probably not going to immediately want to attend your one hour or seventy five minute webinar unless right. they know you a little bit more. So, um, yeah. So there's there are some shifts happening, and it really comes down to who you want to target. Mm -hmm. what their time tolerance is. So, like for a lot of business to business people that are targeting like CEOs, for example these CEOs have more money than time. So they want, they, if they see something that intrigues them, they'll take action, but they're not going to give you a ton of time, you know, because they're busy people. Right. Right. So something shorter, really direct, not even a video, just like some kind of quick information or just an opportunity for them to like a CEO, like just to, Hey, here's buy this. They'll buy it to get to save the time versus you know, to have to like discover what it is. They'll need a little warm up, but yeah, it's, it's, it's you want a shorter marketing message. I call them get to the point funnels, mm -hmm. you know, and okay. if you're in a B2B environment and you, your offer is clear because awareness is really important. Like how aware are they of your solution? If they're not aware of your solution, then that won't work as well. So mm -hmm. awareness is the missing piece for a lot of copywriting. Right. So with like a VSL, you can't, can you run, you can't, it's got too much text. You can't really run a Facebook ad to those because face is Facebook looking at that as text these days. You mean putting the VSL directly in the ad or, yeah, or having or, them opt in? Yeah. Or, I don't know. I mean, so we, we've had problems with, with the ads fine, but the landing page has the wrong text on it, you know, and they're you is know, it like, like income claims and stuff like that. Yeah. Not even income claims. Yeah. Like, you know, I guess more like health claims or, even from my book, you know, like my, my cash beauty blueprint book that came out, we had to create a different landing page to run Facebook ads to it because Facebook didn't like it, but they didn't tell us why. You yeah. Know? They're, they're, it's kind of a mystery. Yeah, yeah. They're getting more and more sensitive, obviously with their Cambridge Analytica incident and things like that. They're getting much more under the spotlight as far as like what they'll allow. They're getting much more strict. So um, yeah, I mean, generally you have someone opt in for, for that, you know, so you have a page and have them opt in, but yeah, they are kind of getting more picky about the language you use right. for sure. Right. Yeah. So, um, in thinking about, uh, in thinking about this and like marketing and advertising, et cetera, what are some of the mistakes people are making? Like we've kind of touched on them. Um, I recognize them, but like, what are some of the big mistakes people are making in trying to market themselves or their business, whether it's to consumers or other businesses? 
Yeah, it really depends on where they're at in their business. So one, I can give some general advice, but if you're, you know, at the beginning end, you would do one thing a little different than maybe if you're more advanced, you know. Um, Some common ones are not communicating enough with your buyers, your leads, you know, in the sense that we try to come up with everything in our own heads as far as like what they want and those kind of things. So like I just had a call this morning with a, with a company in New York and I told them to survey their leads list and ask them what their, what their biggest challenges and questions are around their topic. So we can just use the same language for our marketing. And then I told them to reach out to their buyers list or their buyers and ask them, why did you buy from me specifically? You know, like what caught, so, and you can just take that stuff and put it right in your marketing, you know, and it's like your, your VSLs, your, your ads, whatever, you know, like just ask, you know, like most of us don't, don't talk to our people enough. Um, so that's a big one. And um, yeah, really focusing on complexity, I think is, is another one. It, again, it depends on where you're at with things, but you know, you really only need to, you know, you need to have a good offer, you need a way to get people interested. You need to generate leads for that offer and you need to be able to convert those leads into clients and customers. And that's really your client acquisition process. And there's a lot to that, mm-hmm. you know, but I think a lot of people try to copy other people that are further along than them. And that leads them to confusion and frustration because sometimes you're copying somebody who has like a full team of people and you're like a solopreneur guy or gal and you're just, you're doing the wrong things in the wrong order. So there's no way you can keep up or even know what's working on the back end because, or, or you've got to be a professional digital marketer to make it, make it happen. So a lot of people, you'll see these Ascension funnels where they're like running ads to like a little offer and then they'll try to get them to buy this offer. And then finally they'll sell them the bigger mm-hmm. thing up here. You know, in most cases you can just go right to selling the bigger thing, you know, and, and, and um, so anyway, those are some examples. Yeah. yeah. Or like, I'll look on, I'll be scrolling on my Facebook feed and I'll see ads for start a digital agency. I'm like, why do you think I'm a digital agency or, or come to chiropractic in Illinois? I'm like, I'm not even close to Illinois. Yeah. Like, you know, there's, there's some, those are some big glaring ones. Let's say like when you were getting started and moving from being a clinician to online only, what were some of the things that you did like that you experimented with or tried or that they didn't quite work the way you expected? And is there something you would do differently now? Yeah. Looking back, like what would I do differently in in that transition? Yeah. Well, I mean, I saved up some money before I did it. So that was a recommended thing. Like I had a good runway for about a year. Um, So I did, I did this on the side for a while while I was still practicing and saved up several thousand dollars before I ever made the jump. Um, But what would I do differently? You know, Part of it's a confidence thing, but I would have probably charged more money earlier. I would have mm-hmm. probably skipped trying to build a bunch of complexity. Like I kind of fell into what most people do. They look to copy kind of the other people out there. And, you know, I was, 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 um, I just didn't have the foundational pieces. I don't, I didn't have the understanding that I do now of like the foundational pieces of having an online coaching or consulting business that I do now. And, and, you know, my offers weren't structured, right? Like I used to just, just, just try to sell like a course to people and stuff, you know, and that's great. And you can build buyers lists and yada, 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 but that you don't even really need to do that in a lot of cases. Like I wish I would have just gone more to like higher in selling right away and just kind of focused on some simple systems versus trying to like make this course thing work too much. Not that I didn't make it work or couldn't sell some of them. I did, but, but it, I, I make a lot more money now with, with the structure that I have than I did with, with all of that. So you just don't know what you don't know at the time. And, you yeah. know, even mentors will tell you to do different pieces and stuff like that. But um, I would have, I would have just simplified things a lot more. I would have sell, sold things at a higher price earlier first. And, and, you know, those would have been some of the big shifts I would have done. Yeah, I think, you know, we were talking a little bit before we we started about, you know, people wanting to, you know, come online with the technology and like now, like with technology, it's really easy to, you know, for you and me, I feel like it's really easy to make like a, a, a an ebook yeah. or a VSL or a course or a video, but just the having that content isn't the only piece of the puzzle. Can you talk about like, what are the other pieces of the puzzle once you have your content that are necessary to be able to have a successful, you know, a career or business or you know, coaching program or 
you know, online, yeah. you know, something. You know? So, I mean, content's important. And, but you know, so many people get caught up in the tools and, and all those kind of things. And look, I, I know you got to understand some of that stuff, but it has gotten a lot easier. You can also hire people for a reasonable fee to set things up for you. Sometimes finding those people that are do a sack factory job isn't always easy, right? You'll, mm-hmm. you'll go through a few contractors maybe that you're not satisfied with, but, but it's, it's doable today. Like when you and I were starting, you had to do a lot more, like there was no, page builders software really or anything like that right i mean they had some wordpress stuff and that was about it yeah um so so that part's getting easy so the tools won't make you a success and i think people like to look at that stuff because it's flashy or interesting or you know they'll see the flashy tools and think that that's what they need to learn which are tactics right these are tactics Mm -hmm. um and what you really need is a strong strategy before you ever even look at, look at tactics. And when you're new, you just don't know what you don't know kind of thing. That's why hiring a mentor or someone to guide you, like Aaron, you know, he could guide you through this stuff, right? Like of how to, where to focus and all that. Um, you know, people don't know how to make offers effectively. Like they don't know how to make a good offer. Mm-hmm. Don't know how to sell um, or educate to, to a point of selling. Like I don't really consider myself a salesperson, but I'm, I'm fairly good at enrolling people because I have such a great marketing process and what I call a pre-call process that really, really uh, nails it. Um, and they, so they don't know how to sell. They don't know how to make a good offer. They don't know how to communicate with language well and stuff like that. So, and they, and they really don't maybe understand their customer and what they want or their client and what they want well enough because you know the, the tech tools are great and, and having videos and having PDFs or whatever is great, but those are just like shells that, that good stuff needs to go inside, right? And the, and the appropriate stuff needs to go inside. And so I think people make the mistake of trying to thinking that that's what's going to get them success when in reality, knowing your ideal client, knowing the language to use, knowing the problems you're going to solve, knowing how to make a good offer, knowing how to sell that offer, all of these pieces need to, to, to be in place. Yeah. Yeah. So it more than like what I've learned and what I know it's I, with some of this, it's also right. Knowing what my perspective, client, patient, customer, what they want and the language that they use for it too. Like, right. Yeah. I mean, it's really, there's a, there's some foundational stuff that needs to be in place, even for people at like the six figure plus level, you know, it's like they, they still need that work, you know, and, and there's so many missing pieces and holes and all that. So, yeah, no, that's, that's important. And I want to point that out because it's not just in like my clinic or in your business. It's like in, in all these businesses that we actually have to like you said, we have to have an offer. We have to know what people want and we have to have some kind of process to, I think what you said is most important is to basically educate and sell them on the service and solution and need for it almost before you actually actually have this conversation with them about it. Yeah, that's huge. You know, that's, I, I do, I work a lot in like a higher end sales and stuff like people mm-hmm. selling thousands of dollar items and on up. And so I, most of the people I work with are looking for clients and, and, and these are higher dollar clients and most of them enroll them through some kind of conversation, right? Mm-hmm. So what happens before the conversation actually is, is, is 80% of it. Like if you, if you, if you're marketing and your pre conversation process is dialed in, I mean, the calls are, the calls and conversations are just so much easier. Yeah. What's the, um, what, like working with some of your clients, what's like one of the smallest tweaks you've made that's made the biggest difference on at the end of the day or the back end of it? Yeah, I have to think. Um, you know, I had a guy I was working with a couple of years ago that comes to mind that was a, um, he ran an environmental company. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, had a, they were selling training on how to help improve your, your, your yields in your land, right? So they were targeting farmers and landowners and stuff. It's kind of a weird niche, but it's actually a very um, high ROI niche because if you can improve these things, the, the yields of the land produce more and you make more money and all that kind of right. stuff. So they had a, a world-renowned scientist on their team and, and, and I was working with their head of marketing and, um, and they were doing webinars and, and they were doing okay with these webinars. They were able to generate um, usually around 25 grand or so per webinar campaign. And these were live webinar campaigns. Um, but they really didn't know what they were doing. They had a lot of interest in there. They had a great product. They had a lot of interest. So they were kind of just doing what they could with what they knew and still having some results. 
but I looked at their, their, their process and they were missing all kinds of pieces to it. Like they really, they didn't have a great way of positioning their offer on the webinar. They didn't have a good follow-up sequence, which as you know, is really important. Like your webinar is just like part of the funnel, but it, there's actually a lot of ways to make money and income and get clients around the webinar as well. So we added that piece. We added a strong back end and helped them optimize their, their, um, their, their offers. So we just tweaked it a bit. We didn't really change anything else. And they went from like 25 grand a campaign to over a hundred thousand dollars a campaign, you know, running these webinars like consistently. And, and they made well over a half a million dollars work when we were working together, just, mm -hmm. just by using these webinar campaigns more effectively. And, and then we, we talked a little bit about getting more leads in the front of that. And, and it was really a kind of a layup kind of situation for me, you know? <laughs> yeah. That's awesome, man. That's, yeah. That's killer. You know, it's interesting. I think people get stuck in the, I need more leads or I need more clients, customers, et cetera. And the marketing piece, you know, and I see it's like, it's, it's, is that, is that because marketers are great at selling marketing or is that because people aren't really understanding like that, we can get you a lot of leads, but if you don't know how to convert them and enroll them into your programs or into your, you know, into therapy or into your coaching or into your course, like it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really matter how many leads you put in. Yeah. I mean, there's certainly part of that, you know? Yeah. Um, so the, it depends on your business model a little bit, but like I, you know, I always kind of think about, okay, like if, if someone's having a trouble selling or getting clients, it's like, okay, where, where in the process are things broken down or where, where's the constraint? Mm -hmm. So oftentimes it is the, you know, the tip of the funnel, like they're not getting enough visibility. So it's like, well, what are you doing to get visible? Like for your clinic or for your course or your coaching? Well, you know, I'm maybe doing a few little things. No, you're just, you're just not getting visible, you know, like right. no wonder no one's coming to you, right? So like you got to get some visibility if you're not putting yourself out there, if you're not going where your ideal clients are and putting your marketing messages in front of them, you're not going to get any leads, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's often an issue. And then from there, it's like, okay, how many leads are you getting consistently? If you're not getting a consistent amount of leads to make offers to, then that's a problem, right? Right. Um, so maybe they're getting, but you know, so that's most people's problem. They're just not getting visible enough or they're not generating enough conversations with clients and prospects, you know? And then if, if they are doing that though, then, then what's the next step? Well, they're not enrolling them effectively. Mm -hmm. So so if, if they're like, well, I'm getting tons of interest and inquiries and stuff, and I feel like they're the right people, but I just can't get them, you know, into my program. Well, maybe we need to look at your offer then. Are you making it too hard for someone to start working with you? Are you, are you not presenting it well? Or, you know, all these aspects. And then if they, they're doing all those things well, it's like, okay, well, like what kind of back end do you have? Are you, how are you maximizing, you know, the value of your customers and clients? Like if you have a clinic and you're offering a, 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 a you know, complimentary massage or assessment as your entry offer to get them in, you know, how are you taking them from there to, to a longer term relationship with your clinic? You know, are you, you know, doing one-off um, sessions? Do you have any kind of continuity offers or anything mm -hmm. like that you could add, like where people are paying a subscription or it depends on what kind of your business model would be. But, you know, so those are some things you think about, like, you know, you kind of go through the journey, like how do you, how do you get visible? How do you generate leads? How do you make, how do you acquire new clients? How do you maximize the value of your, of your clients that you get? And how can you offer more things to your current clients so that you can grow your business that way? Yeah, that's awesome. What, what are some of the best ways like to maximize the value of the current clients that you already have? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's, it's something that people forget about a lot, right? And, yeah. and, and they just, they're always looking for just the brand new clients, which is the most expensive time consuming thing to get, right? I mean, if you can keep a client for a long time, maximize their value, your business will grow without the need to keep pumping money into marketing on the front end as much, mm -hmm. right? So, so I mean, part of it's how you structure your offers. Like, you know, usually there'll be some kind of like try, try me offer or an entry offer. Um, not always, but sometimes. And then it's like, okay, you know, there's different models you could use and it, it's going to depend on your mo your business, but you know, is there a way to get them to sign up for longer, you know, to, for something or pay monthly or annually, you know, instead of just one offs when they, when they need it, mm -hmm. you know, you got to kind of do some math, right? Um, are there other offers like affiliate offers or other people's offers that complement yours that you could maybe pay, create a package deal around 
and, and offer them, you know? So it really comes down to like, can you get them paying you more frequently and longer at higher amounts if possible? Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and kind of thinking for your business model, like what would make sense? And you would probably know more than me as far as like physical therapy, like how do you maximize a patient um, with, you know, giving them obviously what they need and not trying to gouge them or anything. But, you know, I'm sure you've done this in your clinic a lot where you have a different offers or processes or ways to continue to work with your clientele. Right. Yeah. And that's the one tricky, like if we're talking about like a clinic and online coaching and uh, online fitness business or a, you know, a, uh, environmental group like the one difference in applying some of these principles to a therapy practice is there's sometimes little sticking points around like how like the ethical line like it's not a very clear True. line but it's like okay mrs jones you, you clearly don't need 50 visits of physical therapy for an ankle sprain you know um but i want to also i want to be able to offer people the right um you know, like the right thing and thing that they need and incentivize my staff <laughs> ethically as well. And so that that's just that one little piece. And it sometimes it takes a little work to figure yeah. it out. But yeah. you know, do you, you I mean, I bet you can see that with some of these. It's like, oh like like let's get you in the continuity program. But Ms. Jones said and actually need it, right? Or maybe it's maybe a wellness continuity program or it depends on kind of if you want to do that in your clinic or not, right? Like some chiropractors probably have something like that or PTs probably do like uh you know, you know, now that they're healthy, we do have a wellness program, you know, it's X amount a month. Yeah. Depends like a if you gym, -ish, offer. gym type of program. Maybe. We do like a, we, we have massage and yoga and health coaching. So that's kind of. You have other offers for them. Offer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and some of them probably take that up on, take you up on that. I'm sure some of them do. Right. So oh, yeah. that increases the value of those clients to your clinic, you know, so that's kind of what you're talking about. Maximizing yeah. your clients. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What, um, when you're looking at a, when you're looking at a business, like let's say even just an all digital business, what are some of the other things that you typically see are missing from people being able to maximize their clients value? Yeah. I mean, so a lot of people they'll acquire leads and then they'll just not do anything with them. They'll, they'll maybe make an offer up front or something. And then they're just kind of sitting on an email database mm -hmm. or whatever. So one of the, one of the most common things is not, not being frequent enough. People like kind of worry that they're going to bother people or as long as you can provide value, I would increase your frequency of like how often you're sending emails or messages and things like that so that you can get some more clients off the list that you paid money to, to build. Right. Um, so that's one thing. Um, most like digital businesses, they, they, they'll, they'll have a front end offer and that hopefully is good. And if they get that good, then they don't really have like a, what's called a back end offer or a way again to kind of like continue working with, with the best clients. Like I have a client that's a, uh, that's a $9 billion company that I've been working with for, for over a year now. And they pay like really nice fees, you know, like every month, you know, or they pay quarterly actually that they're paying me quarterly. And, um, and yeah, so like that's, I'm maximizing my value with them by continuing to have something to offer them longer versus if it was just like, Hey, here's this one little thing. It's, you know, a month or, you know, a few sessions or whatever. And like some, some coaches online will sell hourly packages or little things. And sometimes you can start with those or downsell to those. But if that's your core offering, you're really kind of shooting yourself in the foot as far as being able to grow with the amount of clients you're getting. Right. So kind of what you're saying is like most people have like this one offer and they don't have a what's next. They don't have like a even what's after that. They, you know, right. They're if just we're, focusing on one thing. Yeah. If we're talking about how to maximize your, your, your client value, then yeah, that's true. They, they, they have one offer that's kind of a one off and that's it. So like, just for like for you, maybe they come to you for physical therapy, but then you can say, Oh, we have these other wellness offers here too, that you can partake in. Maybe, you know, and maybe they could get on a subscription for, for yoga, maybe monthly, or maybe they get on like a package deal or whatever. You just, you know, and then you got to look at your margins, obviously, for those services. Mm -hmm. But if they're decent margins and, and, and they really add a lot of value to your clinic, then you, you have other things to offer them for longer, you know. And that's awesome. Yeah. So, John, like after studying like all this marketing, being an expert in like marketing, sales, offer creation, like this journey of like you know how do we warm up people and do all this stuff when you're out in public are there is there something that you see other businesses doing like the restaurant that you go to or you know the gym like that just like kind of drives you nuts and you're like you know, is there, do you see these things in, <laughs> it, like because i do but like do you see these things too 
Yeah, I do. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously the customer service part is one part of it that you and I see as people, as yeah. business owners, but that's kind of obvious. Um, yeah, I mean, I, th- I think, uh, you know, one, one example that comes to mind is some, is sometimes they'll step over dollars to get to pennies a little bit. So like one, mm-hmm. I remember an ice cream shop I went to, I, I, I couldn't buy ice cream at cause they didn't take credit cards. <laughs> And I, and I know that they're saving money on the credit card fees a little bit, but that's like kind of short term thinking because like a lot of people don't carry cash anymore. So like mm-hmm. the fact that you're not taking my credit card means I'll probably never come back to your store, you know? Right. So it's kind of like, again, not thinking long term about things. Um, restaurants, sometimes they, they have um, too many options and stuff like that, you know, that, you know, instead of being really good at like a few things, they tend to do too many things and and I feel like that can kind of backfire for certain restaurants. Um, obviously, your marketing, you know, the messaging and stuff, you're always kind of looking at like, what? That doesn't make sense at all. Or like, this is stupid or, you know, whatever. You know, you kind of pick at things sometimes. Um, Girl Scouts could be, Girl Scouts, Girl Scouts should be giving away free samples of their cookies and they'll mm-hmm. crush it. They, but they, they're so cute, they get away with it, I guess. Right. But like, because they're always like, do you want to buy some cookies? You know, like that kind of thing. You're like, oh, you feel like a, a jerk if you don't buy them. You know what I learned? Because my girls are in Girl Scouts. Girl Scouts of America or whatever is the largest distributor of cookies in the United States. Nice. So yeah. like they, they, they probably don't even think like we need to do it, right? But, but think about what if, if, if the company thought about a strategy they taught the Girl Scouts to say, instead of saying, hey, do you want to buy some cookies? You, you, if, they, if they made like little bite-sized samples or something and went up to people in, with a little plate and said, hey, would you like to try a Girl Scout cookie? Yeah. I guarantee more people would feel like it's the law of reciprocity, right? Like right. more people would feel like they would need to buy a box afterwards. Right. They could so just that, create bags of individually wrapped cookies or yeah. small versions of some of the bigger ones and be like, here, and people, I'm sure people would buy a ton of them, right? They would make more money. I guarantee it. I mean, they would have to give a little bit of like a little bit away in, pro- in their product, but I guarantee they would make more money. And that's just, that's the whole point is like some businesses make it too hard for people to start a working relationship yeah. with you, you know, and the Girl Scouts get away with it because they're so cute and it's kind of famous, the Girl Scout cookie thing. But but I guarantee if like your, your daughter, you know, had a little, if she was allowed to, I don't know if that's even allowed in the Girl Scout, but if they, if they would do that, I, I bet you they would make more money. Yeah, I, I, I think you're probably right. Um, well, that's really awesome, John. It's a great place uh, to end and I want to be respectful of your time today. So if someone wants to learn a little bit more about, about you and what you're doing now, um, what's the best place to find you, whether it's online, Instagram, Facebook, somewhere else? Yeah, so I mean, you can put my name into Google or, you know, and there's lots of stuff that come up. I'm on all the social networks. Uh, a couple places you can go to on the internet. Um, one is a Facebook group for uh, coaches and consultants who are, you know, make, having, they're usually making like a high five figure plus kind of thing. So I don't usually work with like total beginners anymore. You know, they usually have mm-hmm. some momentum. But um, you can check out that group if that's you, if, you want, if you're a coach or consultant. It's groupwithjohn.com. You just go to groupwithjohn.com and, and it'll take you to the Facebook group. Um, you can go to workwithjohn.co. That's workwithjohn.co. And there's a few options there as far as like how we can work together potentially. Um, you know, there's a, a video you can watch there on, on my processes. Um, there's also another link to the Facebook group and then also a place where you can book a call with me if you go to workwithjohn.co. Um, that'll come up. Or you can just check me out at johnschumacher.com. Check out my blog. There's lots of resources there. And if you want to chat, you can also reach out to me through through my, my website. Awesome. Awesome. Well, John, thank you so much for being here. And thank you for being one of the first people to believe in me. Oh, shoot, you know, man. I, I, knew, I knew you had something, you know, <laughs> but it was like, you know, you, you've just taken off, man, to your credit. You just kind of, have, I admire your consistency. You know, you've been Thank focused you. and, and you've stayed on, on brand for a number of years. And, you know, you're, you're, you're probably a little, you're much better at that than I am as far as my experimental kind of nature. But um, it, it's, it speaks to your consistency. And, you know, you got a great niche. You're, you're consistently in front of them. You're a perfect example of, of growing in, in the online space. Yeah, well, I really appreciate that, man. Thank you so much. And I hope one day, like, we'll get to meet in person because this is oh, yeah, a we have huh? cross-country relationship. Yeah. I know, I know. So crazy. one day that'll happen. Well, um, thank you very much again for being here. And if you're listening, this is the Cash BT Lunch Hour with uh, Aaron LeBauer and John Schumacher. Now, go out and just don't make it hard for your customers to do business with you. There you go. Give them a great offer. We'll see you on the next show. Thank you so much.